last week we talked about how there's no step within the family of God. It's just, there's no stepfather, it just was a father. Joseph was part of that genealogy, that important investment into the life and the humanity of Jesus. Today, I want to jump way back into the Old Testament, into the book of Ruth, as we see another one that's listed in the genealogy of Jesus. There's a man named Boaz. Boaz is listed there, and some of you might know that, but many of you might not even know who that is. But there is a great story that invests us in who Jesus was because of who his ancestors were. And the thing that I want us to understand right out of the gate is that hospitality, hospitality was important within God's people. Early God's people, hospitality was a command. It was an essential thing. Because they lived in a a dry and arid place where, where if you did not have water, you did not survive long. And so when people would travel from town to town, they might not have friends and family in every town. And so when they would show up in town, they would go to the center place where people would draw water. And they would basically sit there and someone had the responsibility to invite them home. I mean, that's kind of a crazy environment. We don't go to the center of town and say, okay, where are the people that have nowhere to go tonight because I have a responsibility to care for you? There was a hospitality requirement within the people of God. This is how life was then. It says this, Leviticus. Now, if you don't know about Leviticus, Leviticus is basically the rules that God had set in place to say, I want you to be healthy and well. I want you to survive. It wasn't limitations and stuff like this. It was how to be successful and productive within the world. And that's what the the laws were at that time. He says, man, I want you to thrive. And I want humanity to thrive. I want society to thrive. And so I want you to function in a way that's productive. And in Leviticus 19, it says this. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. A foreigner residing amongst you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. For you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. He says, just because you don't know them doesn't mean that you can't take care of them. Just because they don't, they don't function like you doesn't mean that you don't have a responsibility. There was a hospitality necessity requirement within God's people. And this is the, the society that we find ourselves in when we get to the book of Ruth. Because they were living in the promised land. And things were good amongst them. But it wasn't good for everyone. Because even still, there was a risk that some had in the early culture. There was a risk that many had. Even though there was a hospitality requirement, I'm not trying to be rude or anything. I'm just telling you historically the way it is. Women had risk. Women in this culture were under risk, especially if they weren't connected with a man, there was a risk that they took in society. And so we see here that there is a couple of women that this book, the book is named Ruth because it is named after a woman because she uh, she had been married, but her husband had died. She was taking care of her mother in law, Naomi. And her husband had died, and her sons had died, and there was no men left within their circle. And so they were at risk. They went back home to Naomi's family, not to Ruth's family. They left where Ruth was from, but they went back to Naomi's family, and they were trying to find some way to take care of themselves. They were at risk. See, the elderly were also at risk in this early culture. If you did not have family that supported you, there was no social system in place to care for you. You know, children were at risk. The poor were at risk. The ill were at risk. There were people that were at risk, even though they were commanded to demonstrate hospitality. They were commanded to love other people. And so in the midst of this, Ruth is there Wondering how she's going to care for her mother-in-law. How they're going to care for each other. And they were sitting there and and they had very real needs. They had to survive. They had to eat. But they did not have land that they could care for at this point. 
and they had no one to do it. And so Ruth, the Moabitess, this is what it says in Ruth 2, verse 2. See, she was from a different country. Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. That they knew that there was a risk that they were taking. But she says, we will not survive if we don't do this. And so she says, I care about you. And so let me go into the fields. And as they are, as these harvesters, as these men are taking care of the grains in the fields and they're bringing it out together, let me follow behind because some might fall. And as it falls, I might pick it up and I might get something that we can eat for this day, for this week. We need to survive. And, and they knew that, that she was going to go at risk. A woman by herself in a land that wasn't her own, in a place that she didn't necessarily belong. How were people going to treat her? Would they uphold the standard of hospitality? Or would they abuse her and take advantage of the situation? But the mother-in-law said go. I mean, she had an expectation. She had a hope at least. While it says, let me go find a field where someone has favor on me. She's hoping, please let them show favor to me. Because otherwise it can go tragically wrong and the story could end up a different direction. But she was at risk. And so she went into the field and she started to gather behind the people that were gathering within the field. And the owner of the field comes home. And he, you know, is greeting people in the name of the Lord because he was a devout man of God. And he starts greeting all of his people and his harvesters and stuff. And he says, hey, God be with you. God be with you. And all of a sudden he looks out and he says, hey, who's that woman out there? Not in a way that is negative, not in a way that is condemning. He just says, there's someone I don't recognize out here. And I own this land. And he wasn't upset because she was stealing from him. Because he understood the hospitality that he needed to have. And he says, there's someone I don't recognize. Is there someone that needs to be taken care of? Because I have a responsibility to uphold the rules of God. And it says this, you know, that uh, Boaz was kind and generous to Ruth. He saw her, he recognized that he was an honorable man right out of the gate. He didn't see, what can I gain from this person? Is there something that I can gain from them? But rather, what can I extend to them? What kind of grace can I show? And it says this, so Boaz said to Ruth, he went out to her. They said, oh yeah, that's Ruth, that's Naomi's daughter-in-law, and, and they're trying to figure out how to survive so they're following behind and they're picking up the grain that goes behind us and he says well done and so he walks out to Ruth and he says Boaz said to Ruth my daughter listen to me don't go and glean in another field he says don't waste your time going somewhere else you are welcome to be here in my field don't go into another field and don't go away from here stay here with my servant girls watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. He says, you are welcome at any time to come and to glean from my field. We always have excess enough for you and your mother-in-law. In fact, not only do we have excess for you and your mother-in-law, but if you ever get thirsty, once again, it is a dry, hot land. He says, you ever get thirsty, go up and take the water from the men. I have instructed these men to treat you with respect. These men will not mistreat you. You don't know what you're going to get somewhere else. But these men will treat you well. This is what he shared with her. And this had to put her at ease because once again, she had gone into the field wanting to find favor. Wanting someone to say that she was welcome and accepted. And she sure enough did. She had found someone and a place where she would be safe and secure and able to get the food that she needed to support her and her mother-in-law. There's one interesting thing in this, is that we see that, that it's interesting how grace promotes grace. When there is a gift of grace to people, grace usually comes back. 
But a lot of times we like, until I get some grace, until someone shows me favor, I'm not going to extend favor. And that's why our world is so difficult and challenging. Because we don't want to be the first ones to extend grace. See, there was a backstory here of what was going on. And it's an important backstory because Boaz was a righteous man, but he had also heard some things about this woman, Ruth. And there was something that impacted him in a dynamic way. And it says this, so she went at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? She was overwhelmed by the grace that he was giving. He says, why do you behave this way? And Boaz replied, I've been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. I've heard of the grace you showed to your mother-in-law. And grace fills me with a desire to extend more grace. When people start showering love on other people, love starts to expand. And this is the thing, this is why God wants his people to show hospitality, to show favor, to show grace to others. Because he says, it just makes it all better because people start functioning in a gracious manner towards one another. He says, you know what, I am a righteous guy, but I can't just say that I'm a righteous guy. That's why I'm treating you well. I'm treating you well because, man, I've heard all the good stuff you've done. And if you're going to do that, I have means and I have ability. I, who am I to not show you favor when you are showing favor to others? And so this is what he does. And we need to understand that. And even in the midst of this grace, so, so Ruth is like, wow, this is so good. She goes home and she takes her sheaves back to, to Naomi and she says, look at what we have. And she's like, wow, someone has shown you tremendous favor. Who is it? And she says, oh, it's Boaz. And she says, wow, I know Boaz. In fact, he's a relative of mine. And so that's really great that he's showing you favor. Continue to go back to his place. Now, Boaz, in the midst of this, as you read the story, that he instructs his servants as they are, as they are, as, as harvesters, as they are harvesting. He says, as you harvest, don't just bind it all up. Take some out and throw it by the wayside so that those that come back behind have a lot more than just the normal. He says, you know what? People have need here, and he says, bind it up and throw some and act like you're not that good at your job. I mean, that's what he instructed them to do. And so that's what they did. And so, and so Ruth would continue to gather, and she's like, wow, look at all that I brought home today. Look at all that I brought home. And she's thinking, man, I am so good at this thing. And she's blessed, and you could think that, that, that there is just a tremendous blessing in that, and that the story of Ruth continues on, but there's still something that Ruth needs. Because she still is gathering, and she still is disconnected. It still is just her and her mother-in-law. Now, they have a great, dynamic, wonderful relationship, but there's still not a connectedness to a greater family. And we need that connectedness to a greater family. I'm not going to be that guy that stands up here and says, well, every woman needs a man. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying they needed a greater connectedness to a family. And it was just the two of them. And that was going to continue to promote difficulty and hardship to them. And so they needed that connection. And so what ultimately Ruth needed was a covering. She needed a covering of the family, of the structure that says, you know what, you belong because I have brought you in. Not only am I going to show you hospitality, but there's a greater step that goes along with this. There's something that extends beyond. It says, not only am I going to leave some grain for you, but I'm going to provide a covering for you. I'm going to provide something out there that you need that supports you beyond what you have. And so... Naomi sits there and goes, you know what? We still have need. Although we're eating well, there needs to be something to have true future and to have few, uh, better connectedness and better hope. And she says, you know what? Boaz is one of my relatives. See if he will extend a covering to us to take the responsibility to really bring us into the family and provide a long-term care situation. 
And so he instructs, uh, Naomi instructs Ruth, now go while he's, after he's harvested and stuff, go and hang out where he's sleeping and kind of sleep by his feet. I mean, it's kind of a weird situation. People did stuff weird at that time. I'm not just trying to say this, but there's something, because not just that you want to be by the feet of a guy that's been working all day, that'd be a stanky place to be. But go by his feet because there's something there and ask if he will extend his covering onto you. And so that's what she does. She goes and she goes into the threshing floor where Boaz was and, and he was taking care, of, you know, he's eating and doing this stuff and then he went to sleep and she saw where he went to sleep. And so she went over by his feet and she laid down. And in the middle of the night, Boaz is like, wait a second, there's someone down at my feet. You know, you get into that, you know, nervous twitch or whatever. You know, he's extending out. He's like, oh, come on. I, this is uncomfortable for me. And so he pops up, and this is what he says. Who are you? He asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. You are part of my greater family because I am connected with Naomi and you are a some kind of relative. You are a kinsman of Naomi. And so will you extend your covering over me? Now there's two things here. There's, there's that relative aspect, that kinsman aspect, but there's a redeemer aspect. Because she had lost her husband. Both of these women have lost their husbands. They had lost their source of security and support and structure of the family. And he says, not only will you extend family, but that will you redeem? Will you take on part of my challenges? And that's what she's asking. Now, this guy could have rightly said, nope, ain't going to happen. Because even though he was a kinsman redeemer, there was one that was closer. He could have just said, nah, sorry, there's another that's closer. But it says that he spread out his covering over her. Now, now see, there's something that goes along with that. Now, I'm, I'm sitting there as I'm, as I'm chilling and I am casual and comfortable and relaxed I just love, you know, I mean, it's probably cold situation and stuff. They got it all nestled up here. And, and all of a sudden, then someone's there. See, you got to understand that it's not like spread upon spread upon spread. But when she came and he had to extend that, that there was a cost. There was a, a, a responsibility. There was something that it actually took from Boaz in order to extend the covering to Ruth. And he says, you know what? I am willing to do it. In fact, I want to do it. I choose to do it. But let me ask the one that's closer than me first. And so he goes to the one that's closer. And this is what we need to understand. Because he goes to the one that's closer and he says, hey, there is someone here that needs a kinsman redeemer. They want the covering to be shed over them. Will you do it? And at first the guy says, yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Boaz goes, okay, great. You go ahead and take care of it because, you know, there's, a, a, there's, you know, Ruth that goes along with it. And so you'll have to marry her and stuff like that. And he's like, what? No. No, I don't need any more of that drama. And so he pulled away from it. He was the closest kinsman redeemer. In fact, in many situations, he would have the responsibility to care for that. But it shows right there that he chose not to. And because he turned away from that, the mantle fell to Boaz. And Boaz went, with her, went back to her and extended his covering over her. Now in, in, in the terms that we're talking about here, it meant marriage. That he chose to marry, to partner his life with her. Now that doesn't seem like a very romantic way to get connected with someone, but there's a greater sense of understanding of what that actually meant. See, because we need to understand what does a covering really look like? What does a covering look like as you extend yourself, as you say, okay, I'm going to take a piece of this off. Think about it as a cold night. You're like, man, I was warm, I was toasty, I was comfortable in this situation. But a covering is taking on risk to bring security to someone else. Because he says, you know what, I've got things all lined up here, but I will take on your risk. 
so that you have a little bit more security, so that you can be who God's created you to be. It's letting go of comfort to enable provision. To say, I don't care about my comfort. Just like sitting in this thing. You know, I don't care if I don't get all the comfy blanket. Because you need to survive and be healthy and well also. It's forgoing benefits while extending honor. It's lifting her up. It's saying not only that you are are, are a woman that just cannot fend for herself, cannot legally do all these things. It's saying I am lifting you up and saying you have value. You have position. You mean something. Now he's extending himself. He's extending his benefits instead of saying I get all of that. It's accepting limitations for others is freedom. Limitations. See, we live in a world that says, oh, I just want to be free. Whatever keeps me from being free, I want to resist. And I'm here to say that we are called to extend a covering over others. Men, there's a reason why I am having this talk on Father's Day. Because Father's Day is a great day where many of us can sit there and say, you know what? I deserve to be treated with honor and respect. I deserve the bacon when I roll in here. Because I bring home the bacon. Some guys, we feel like this. But I'm here to tell you that Father's Day is not meant for us to just get all of the glory, get all the accolades. It's for us to understand that we have a responsibility to extend the covering. If we've been given the mantle of being a father, we have a responsibility to go out of our way to be a blessing to those that we have a responsibility to cover. Our spouse, our kids. What a blessing that is that God has given us. And it's not so that we get all the credit. We get all the glory. It's so that we can then extend this covering. We can take on risk to bring them security. So that we can let go of comfort. So that they can have provision. So that we can forego our benefits. So that they can have the honor. And they can rise up to be the people God has intended them to be. It's so we can accept limitations. So that they can experience freedom. That's what it means to be a father. That's what it means to be a man of God. Are we extending the covering? Or are we just expecting everyone to come and bring us the blessing? Boaz wasn't like that. Our heavenly father is not like that. He's the one that's continuing giving of himself in a costly way. So that each one of us could have the covering that we so desperately need. Here's the thing that I want us to understand as we talk about this is that, man, I truly want us to rise up and be men. And I'm going to read here because I don't want to mistake what I say. I don't want us to be men, not for the poor, the helpless, the weak, and the needy women. I want us to be men for the strong, the confident, the courageous, and the gifted women that God has put into our life. See, too often we look at them as lesser. They're not lesser. They are value. Boaz did not look at Ruth as someone that was needy that he had to come into contact with. He saw this as someone that would bring a blessing into his life as much as he's bringing a blessing into her life. If you read the story, he was like, "Woo! are you kidding me? You're going to show me this kind of honor by asking me to be your kinsman redeemer? Okay, I accept. See, we're not the knight in shining armor that we want to believe we are. But we still have a responsibility to help the people in our life, the women, the children, the gifted, the courageous, the wonderful people that God has placed into our life for them to be the people God has created them to be. And that's why we extend that covering. So that we can rise them up. We can celebrate the good things that they do. See, as we look to this, and we see that Ruth 
received that covering. She married Boaz. And as it says there, in fact, the very end of the book of Ruth talks about how the lineage was then going to go through them and the Messiah was going to come through that lineage. This is part of Jesus' genealogy, Ruth and Boaz. Because it demonstrates something about who God is in our life. When we are destitute, when we are apart, he's pouring out grace that brings us to him. And when he pours out that grace that brings us to him, all of a sudden we get to that place that says, you know what, I want more of that grace. Will you extend a covering? And he's like, I thought you'd never ask. I want to extend my covering. I will give of myself so that you can rise up to be the people that you're chosen to be. That you're created to be. That you can experience freedom that's not going to limit you by always trying to claw after the scraps. Some of us, we feel like we're clawing after the scraps. Well, we need to accept the grace from the holy God that's created everything and say, God, I just want to trust in you. I want to depend upon you. I want your covering. And he says, I will pour out my covering over you. That's who Jesus is. That's what he did. He went to the cross because he was responsible for people. In the end of Ruth, Ruth 4, it says this. The women said to Naomi, not to Ruth, said to Naomi, the mother-in-law. Check this out. It says, they said, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. Wait a second. I thought that he was the kinsman redeemer for Ruth. Well, you brought in one. You brought in them all. That was the responsibility. And this is what he knew. He says, he has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. That there was a son that came into this. The son that begot someone else, that begot someone else, that begot someone else that eventually became Jesus. There was a blessing that was not just poured out to Ruth. Naomi could have said, well, I'm glad that you got what you got. But the blessing extended to them all. Because once the blessing came to Ruth, the blessing transferred to Naomi. See, here's the thing that I want us to think about on this Father's Day. Not only am I putting a mandate and a challenge out there to men to rise up and to be that covering for your family. But I'm asking each one of us, who's covering you and who are you covering? Ruth didn't just say, well, I got a covering. It's all good for me. She says, my covering's going to go to my mother-in-law and I'll cover you. Who's covering you? And in turn, who are you covering? It's going to be costly. It's going to be risky. It's going to be uncomfortable. But it's going to allow people to be who God's created them to be. I praise God that people have covered me and allowed me to be who God has created me to be. I only pray that I can be that kind of man for my wife, for my kids, for my church. Let's pray together. God. We thank you that you are the one that starts this whole process. You are the one that covers us. When we had no hope, we had no solutions, we had nothing to offer. You have provided a covering for us. God, we accept your covering. God, I pray for those that are in here today that haven't taken that step to accept your covering. And today, you're speaking to their soul that says, I just want to pour out my grace into your life. I want to bring you into my family. I want to raise you up to be who I've created you to be. As they get to that place, help them to say, okay, God, I accept your covering. I accept your grace. I accept your forgiveness. 
I accept the purpose that you have placed into my heart and my life. I choose to be associated with you. I choose to be connected with you. I choose to follow under your covering. God, I pray for those of us in here that know that grace. Help us, Lord, to see the people around us that we need to extend our covering to. God, we see that in ancient times they had a responsibility to hospitality and they still fell short. We today have a responsibility to bring a covering to people. Help us not to fall short. Forgive us for wanting our own comfort, wanting our own safety and security so that we don't extend ourselves to others. Help us, God. We want to be like you. Gracious, kind, generous, loving. Help us to receive a covering and to give a covering. I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.